Okay, I hope you guys have enjoyed your meal. Now it's time to kind of get down to what we're here for. Uh, I appreciate the uh, love and the, uh, the mood in the room. I'm a very moody guy, so when the mood is right, we're okay. Uh, what I do want to do is just recognize uh, some of the efforts that have gone into putting this thing together. Um, I want to thank a few people who helped me uh, organize and get some of the people here uh, so uh, that you understand that it's just not a one-man show. This is something that we all collectively get involved in. So at this moment, Leroy Kearney, are you here? Please stand up, please. We want to thank Leroy and uh, our friend Keisha, who did a great job connecting us to Mr. Cook. Um, as you know, our keynote speaker is a gentleman who needs no introduction, and we'll get into his thing later on, but uh, it's not hard to find, I mean, it's not easy to find people who are on that national scene, and they make themselves available. And uh, so I just want to thank Mr. Kearney again, and though all of you who kind of contributed in having Mr. Cook uh, connect with us and, and, and be here today. Secondly, uh, Sarah, Janet, Pena, are you here? Can you stand up, please? They, they played a very instrumental part in bringing and allowing me to meet uh, Mr. Patino, John, I don't know, we'll read his bio later and kind of introduce you to him. But these young ladies are kind of, went up, we go back to college. And uh, we're long friends. Um, sometimes when you meet good people, you don't have to see them often. It's just when the next time you see them, you reconnect. It's almost like where you left off. So uh, thank you, sister. Appreciate you. Thank you very much. Ms. Rios, you too. Awesome job. And she thought she was bothering me because, you know, sometimes, you know, that phone kind of rings a thousand times and being a head football coach and a father and all the things I have to do, it gets a bit busy. And I was telling her, listen, my wife would say, just stay on. And you did a good job. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Real. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right. All right. So we have uh, a number of uh, nominee honorees that we're going to uh, salute today. And uh, there's no particular pecking order outside of our keynote speaker. But uh, the first person that I want to kind of uh, talk about briefly, I'm going to read everybody's bio. I kind of go, you know, I'm kind of obligated to do it. But I like to kind of speak about them from what I know personally, if I know them. And uh, this gentleman is one of the first people I thought of, uh, believe it or not, when it came to honoring fathers because Growing up in the town, I, I, I'm from East Orange. I grew up uh, in a big family, and one of the people there, there were there were family members, and there were people that kind of, you know, uh, more popular family members, I would say. And there's a few people I could think of. But my cousin Keith Mumford uh, is here today, and we're honoring Keith because Keith has been a, a stalwart in our community. Um, I'm going to read the bio, but just just to let you know. Uh, he's played a very instrumental part in the development of many, many young men in our town. And I've witnessed it, being an educator in East Orange for uh, close to 25 years, um, being in different areas of education, from general ed to special ed. And, uh, so we've interacted and crossed paths professionally in a number of instances, and I, I, I really would be remiss if I didn't say to you, Keith, that I've always appreciated you as a cousin, but I've grown more fond of you as a professional just how you really take care of these young men, and you take the time outside of yourself. We, so, quick story, Keith took a, uh, Keith and his wife Monique started a, a, a uh, spring football league. So if you're into sports, you know that uh, spring football in other states are big. Because in Jersey, we have winter. So we don't get to play in the spring, we're still indoors. So uh, in his infinite wisdom, he started a, a spring football league, I think in 2015. And if you would see the amount, and, and again, there's East Orange, there's teams in Orange now. They have like an eight game schedule. And that's unprecedented in, in this area because, you know, we don't usually do that. But the biggest thing I've noticed is that the young men have gravitated and feel very uh, in tune with their environment because they don't just go home, right? Mama Mo, as we call it, was Keith's wife is a person that uh, has taken a personal interest in each and every one of those young people. And before they come to me as the head coach, they go to them. Ain't that something? I'm the guy, all right? It's supposed to be about me. And I, and I gotta call him to get information. Uh, also, uh, one of the things we've done in East Orange, uh, in terms of football particularly, 
Uh, most kids usually gravitate and leave the city, right? They leave the urban environment. They go to the Don Boscos and Burton Catholics, who I, where I used to coach, and Seton Hall Prep, and all those other places. Well, when I took over the job in East Orange and going into my third year, we've had unprecedented numbers return back to East Orange. 16 to be exact. And that's unheard of. That's never been done Now, on my side of it, we've had to get the academics going. So we have a STEM academy. We have a performing arts school. And we've had schools come through here, like Cornell and Princeton and Lafayette and Fordham. And those schools that never really touched down in East Orange before like that. And I can't say it any further that it's really because of guys like Keith who had the kids and families buy into making your environment better. Don't take your resources away. Keep your resources home. And those are the things that we've seen uh, gains academically. We've seen the kids be more focused. So now when the young people are graduating and leaving eighth grade, they don't want to leave East Orange anymore. They don't want to go where they think the grass is green instead of just fertilizing their own lawn and putting their effort in, those sweat equity. And it has nothing really to do with the kids as more as it has to do with the parents. Right? We, so we're trying to rechange, we change the culture and get people to buy in. And for that, Keith, I just want to let you know again, man, we really appreciate you. Thank you for your effort, All right, so real quick, I'm kind of stick around. Growing up in East Orange, he was a student in East Orange School District where he played basketball for the East Orange Panthers and then over at Clifford J. Scott. Uh, those two schools have combined and now make up the East Orange campus, where, where he tends to remind everyone that uh, they won the championship because of his smooth jump shot and layups. He also played basketball for King University, formerly known as King College. Shout out, Alma Mata. Here we go. Uh, in his younger years, he played in several basketball leagues and tournaments in Elmwood Park, where he graciously earned the nickname Money. As an adult, he remained in uh, Elmwood Park, but on a different level. Not as a basketball player, but over the 11 years as an East Orange Panther football coach, mentor, confidant, and definitely a friend to many of the young boys and girls that played on various levels within the league. In 2015, Mr. Mumford and his wife, Monique, started their own spring football team, the East Orange All-Stars, where they continue to mentor and develop uh, the youth in, in and around the community. He also coached football in Roselle, the Vipers spring football team, and currently the head coach and director of the team at New Jersey Football University national team. And if you know anything about football nationally, FBU is a really big program, kind of like Pop Warner. Keith is the state director. That consists of great talent uh, from all over the state, ranging fifth grade through eighth grade. Throughout his working career, Keith was also an adolescent counselor in the North Renaissance House for four years, a counselor at the Talbot Hall for two years, and director of St. Joe's Daycare for 14 years which shows his love for the youth and goes beyond his own, uh, his own development of his children and family. Mentoring, counseling children, adolescents, and adults through various employment and volunteer efforts throughout his life proves to show that Keith has a good heart. His guidance and intentions are always in the right place. For that, for the better of the youth and the community, he definitely has a special way of communicating and getting through with kids uh, that usually are hard to reach. Um, and for that, we appreciate him. Uh, he will be remembered in and throughout the city of East Orange for all his efforts of love, direction, and communication for the youth. Ladies, gentlemen, Mr. Keith Moore. Thanks for coming out. Uh, thank you to Iota, Phi Theta Fraternity, and Phi Omega Alumni Chapter of Northern New Jersey. Um, first, I'll, everything Ray said is true, first. I'll, <laughs> but I kind of was sitting over there like, wow, who's he talking about? He's saying some good stuff. <laughs> but as I, didn't, I never thought of it as a whole like that. You know, I, I do what I do every day just because that's just what I do. And to sit back and then to put it all together like that, it sounds pretty good. It makes me feel proud. And it's great to just know that somebody notices, you know. Like I said, we get a lot of uh, children that, like I said, we, we talk about the football game. That, that's, like, that's like last. We do so much mentoring and helping for the kids. And then in the meantime, we, we give them a little football, you know. 
So a lot of the parents entrust their kids with us, and we have to do right by them. When Ray talks about the kids come, and they, they come and they ask me, or they come through me and everything, and like I said, I talk with Ray about, oh, we had talked right after the game the other night about the kids that played on the freshman level, and now they're, they're probably going to be varsity players because of the programs that they went through. And, you know, we, we give them a hard time, but they come back and they remember. And once they realize it really wasn't a hard time that they had, because once you grow up, you know, you start becoming an adult, things change. So I just want to say thank you to Ray and all the brothers and everybody out here that uh, I appreciate it. And I do this like, just I just do it for fun. Right? A lot of times it's, you know, we don't, we don't smile all the time when we do it. But at the end of the day, you go home and these guys, they call me and my wife and they text us at night and, you know, we end up texting them back, you know, go to bed, you know, because they got school tomorrow. <laughs> but they are, they, they're like our family. And our, our motto, what's our motto we got now is there's no place like home. Absolutely. All the kids that came back, and like you said, we have the eighth graders and seventh graders, they're not, they're not thinking about, oh, I want to go to DePaul, I want to go to Boston. They want to stay home and play right here in East Orange. So for that, I thank you because without you being there, I don't know how this would have worked out, you know? And I, I just want to say thank you. And happy Father's Day to all the Father's Day. Thank you. Uh, most, most of the class kind of read the same, but I just want to read this. I'm not going to do it for everyone because it's the same thing, but. Uh, this class is presented to Mr. Keith Mumford in recognition of his generous commitment, time, support, and inspiration to our community. Presented by Father Lager on our Father's Day brunch. Congratulations, brother. Now, I would be remiss, um, I know it's Father's Day brunch, but uh, we couldn't do this without the support of his wife. And I say that because Mama Mo, as they call her, is really uh, as much important to anything that we do in East Orange, or actually the surrounding area, because most of the kids are from Essex County, period. North, Orange, you know, they cross the border all the time. So I just want to briefly, but quickly and effectively thank Mama Mo. Can you come on up here, please? Monique, this is a small token of our appreciation for you. Um, we know that it's a team effort. We know that good teams stick together forever. Yes. Um, dealing with your son, he's showing it's not easy. <laughs> you guys do it very well. I want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Here we go. Thank this is in honor of you. This is real quick. Monique, Mama Mo Mumford, in honor of your unwavering support of your husband and your community. Thank you. God bless you. Two kids. Two, three. Got it. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, moving on. Uh, so the uh, I was I was talking to a number of people, and I'm very big on uh, sharing information. Um, I'm not one. Anybody that knows me, uh, I'll give you my last dollar if you need it. I mean, if you need it. Uh, but uh, also, uh, I will also share anything I have. I think um, that is our duty. One of the reasons that I joined this organization and not others is that I didn't want to do things that's been done before. I didn't want to be, no disrespect to anybody, but um, when IOTA Phi Theta was founded in 1963 at Morgan State University, uh, I want you to think about the time and the culture in this country, what was going on. And being in any HBCU at that time, especially on the East Coast, where a lot of things were going on, uh, that was the birth and the vision of 12 men who were from different age groups. Um, some were uh, Army, war, you know, veterans. Some were right out of high school. And they decided to form a group uh, at Morgan to kind of emulate what they thought and what their vision was. And the word iota means one. And what this is is uh, you'll never find two of the same things. Kind of like the fingerprint. Iota is different. You know, you're not going to see us doing the same thing. I mean, we have some things and some rituals we do, but the beauty of this organization is that it's a collective group of men uh, who really work for a common goal. 
And that's what I thought about when I uh, was, was kind of, you know, searching for an organization to be a part of. And going forward, uh, like I was telling you about uh, Sarah and Janet, uh, I was looking for someone to talk to, talk about, uh, who isn't necessarily in my catchment, but they're very effective at what they do. And the next same name kept coming up. I had a bunch of people sending me a lot of things, and John Patino kept coming up. And that's God's work. It's not mine, it's not ours. It's just kind of everybody can't tell the same lie. You know what I'm saying? Especially when we don't know each other. So uh, it, it's with esteem that I read this bio and tell you a little bit about John, and I'm having to come up and say a few words. But uh, we are a group. When I was at King, we. We stuck together as a group. It wasn't about being black or Spanish or whatever. If he was cool, he was cool. And I think we need to get a little bit more of that going on. John Patino he was born and raised and educated in Newark. He served in the U.S. Army National Guard from 2007 to 2012. His professional career began in 2008, working as an employee in the city of Newark as a legislative aide and the North Ward Councilman Annabelle Ramos, Jr. During his tenure as an employee of the city of Newark, John was able to foster relationships between residents and local government. John strived to further his career and to continue to serve the community by serving on various community organizations and public boards such as the Forest Hill Community Association. His passion to serve in his community continued to grow and enabled him to join the North Police Department as a North Special Police Officer. After a year and a half as a North Special Police Officer, John had the opportunity to join the Exus County Sheriff's Office as a Sheriff's Officer. He is currently assigned to the Detective Bureau. He, is, uh, he has received numerous awards and commendations from the Sheriff's Office and various organizations for his commitment uh, to serve his community. John also serves as a State of New Jersey appointee to the City of North's Housing Authority Board of Commissioners. As a commissioner, John uses his experience in local government and law enforcement to ensure that housing authority residents have a safe and decent place to live. Mr. Patino still resides in North with his wife and five-year-old daughter, Ruby, who did say she ate today, so we're happy about that. All right, John Patino, come on up and show. Good afternoon. First and foremost, I would like to thank uh, the Phi Theta fraternity for the tremendous honor. I want to thank the brothers of Phi Omega alumni chapter for the continuing to build a tradition of, of community activism and engagement. I'm proud to be a public servant, and I am proud to be part of the fabric of my community. I was born, I was born and raised in the city of North. I know, I know many people use the cliche and say they have, they have had a rough childhood, but in my case, it is true. Even though I had a difficult upbringing, there were many people in my community that I could rely on and turn to. I could, have, I could have easily have deviated from the path that I took, but my mentors were there to guide me. I credit them for where I am to, today. That's why I know and recognize the point of social service and give it back to my community. That is why I serve at the North Housing Authority as a commissioner and vice president of the Forest Hill Community Association and why I chose to, uh, to be employed by a law enforcement agency as my career. I work every day to be the best father and husband to my family. I am humble and honored. Thank you. The four degrees in recognition of his generous commitment and time, support, and inspiration to our community. We appreciate you, John. Please continue your success. We look forward to your young guys. So you got, got a lot more to do. Absolutely. All right? Who is All right. Moving on. And I hope I'm not moving too fast for you, but uh, I like to kind of get things going so we can fellowship and have good conversation. Plus, I know some other people have some uh, obligations that they kind of got to get with. So I'm trying to move this as fast as I can. Okay. Uh, next. Um, you mind? 
As a matter of fact, hold up one second, Mo. The gentleman that's on, on that screen right there, let me, let me uh, give you a little historical reference, all right? So I don't even know what year it was, man. I just remember, do you remember, what was, what was Jack, what was, what was his address? Right there by the parkway. 60 Parkway Drive. 60 Parkway Drive, baby, was the spot. So if you don't know, um, the gentleman I'm about to bring up has been in uh, entertainment uh, for years. Uh, he's, he's a, he's a, he's a uh, artist in many ways. But uh, we crossed paths years ago, um, and this is when I knew he was a special guy, right? Not because of his prowess to rap and kind of MC, but I had, I had a cousin, I had a younger cousin that was a pretty decent artist as well. So we were up in, in uh, so it was three of them in the Lords of the Underground, and DJ Dad, he had an apartment right over there on Freeway Drive, and we used to go up there and talk, and he used to know Ron, and you know, I'd just be sitting there listening to him. But I remember sitting back on the balcony one night, and the conversation we had, honestly, for like, man, you probably don't even remember, bro. It was like almost an hour. It had nothing to do with music. Nothing. It had everything to do with, you know, he, he's, I'm from East Orange, he's from North. Um, Mr. Colston, who actually is Jazz's uncle, who passed, I think, I don't know if he passed, one of them did, but he was, a, he was in the district where I worked. He was a, a supervisor. So we used to have conversations about uh, our future and the future of our kids. You know what I mean? Not our particularly, but how the, how the generations were raised and kind of changing and the things they were talking about. Because they were, they were in there, you know, they're in the cypher, they're kind of rhyming and figuring about things to talk about. And I remember sitting back there, man, and having conversations about uh, what he wished would happen and how he saw it, what his vision was for the city of North. This is years ago, 20, 20 years ago. I'm like, man, this kid is deep. I'm up there just, you know, trying to get away from my mother and hang out. And he's up there having these deep conversations. But that's what happens when you have a young man who uh, travels the world and has different experiences. You tend, you, you, tend to, you tend to take those experiences and, and formulate your own ideas and point of view, and you don't really work to what we call the slave of the rhythm. You know, you don't do what everybody else does. You kind of get your own way of doing things. And I noticed he was a special guy back then. So uh, just to give you an insight on who he is, we have a short clip. It's not going to be long. I just want to kind of give you an idea of who Mr. Dupree, do it all Kelly is. This is That's just to give you an idea of uh, what he does, one of the things he does for a living. But more importantly, when you're able to stand before people around this world and bring with you the things you've learned from home and just put them on display, that's a tough person. That's a person that, that really has uh, personal confidence, but he has a calm about it. And as you can see, he's a calm brother. Look at him. Sits over there and just kind of smiles every now and then. And everything, you talk to him about all the deep stuff. You know what I'm saying? Let's do it. That's it. It's kind of like you, man. Real, real, just linear and focused, you know? I want to read his bio real quick. Uh, I'm trying to get through it. Uh, but it gives you kind of a good idea of his background. All right, Dupree Do It All Kelly, who is an entertainer, a businessman, and philanthropist. Dupree Do It All Kelly is one third of the legendary trio, Lords of the Underground. Uh, gave us five number one hits, including classic. Yes, please clap that up. <laughs> gave us uh, number one hits, including classic records like Chief Rocker, Funky Child. With over 25 years in the music business, Dupree and his group have inspired many artists and musicians, such as Notorious B.I.G. with Machine Gun Funk and a host of other uh, hosts of others. In 1993, they would have. Uh, they were. I'm sorry they would go on to win the BET Rap Group of the Year Award. In 1994, the mayor of Newark, uh, Newark, New Jersey, Sharp James, would honor the group with their very own day, making Wednesday, September 28th, Lords of the Underground Day. 
Dupree has organized a large mock funeral uh, over the North, over in North, excuse me, bringing together funeral homes and various institutions from all five wards of the city to participate. He never allowed his location or circumstances dictate uh, his desire to help. He will go on uh, to partner with, Fort, with Hip Hop for Flint uh, to raise enough money and put over 500 water filtration systems in homes throughout the city of Flint, Michigan. <laughs> Never wanted to leave his hometown, Dupree and his family, uh, I'm sorry, Dupree and his team were able to negotiate 200 extra systems for families in the North who had their own water issue. Very good. Dupree is a product of the North Public School System, starting at Madison Avenue, Madison Avenue Elementary, later uh, transferring to and graduating from 13th Avenue Elementary School. When attending Exus County Vocational and Technical School in North, uh, he will go on uh, to attend a historical black college and university, Shaw University. Shaw you? <laughs> I was waiting for uh, Where he became a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, which he credits as uh, being a game changer in his life. Dupree is the CEO of Do It All Media Group, formerly known as 211 Media Group, and, uh, and the company uh, that specializes in all groups and aspects of media, television, film production, as well as the event planning and consultation. Do It All Media Group uh, has co-produced uh, for an annual Lincoln Park Music Festival, 24 Hours of Peace Festival, and the Family Unity Festival, which uh, all her, help, was all held in the city of Newark. Dupree is one of the founders of not-for-profit 501c3 company, 211 Community Impact, 211CI, which is a grassroots organization on the grounds of North, uh, impacting the community, addressing literacy, homelessness, mental health, and wellness, education, gun violence, and youth in initiatives. He decided to, uh, sorry, he decided to base the company in the city of Newark, where he was born and raised in credits of helping, which helps him in everything he does today. In 2018, Debris became a candidate uh, for councilman at large in the city of Newark, New Jersey's municipal election, really against incumbents that have been there in office for over 20 years. Although he did not get uh, get the seat, it was not, excuse me, it was not uh, lost as he uh, simplified and actually exemplified himself as a political presence. When asked why he continues to do what he does for the community, he simply says, what does it do? I do it all for no. That's what's up, baby. All right? Um, obviously, I'll be remiss if I didn't say he has a Twitter handle and all that other stuff. You're going to have to give it to him later because it's blow along. But I will say this. Um, all kidding aside, I am honored to call this man a friend. Um, I've watched his personal development uh, in terms of uh, being a community activist. Um, we have friends in the business, some of the mutual friends we have. And, a lot of them talk about doing things, and some of them do. They really do. They do good things, but it's not consistent. Sometimes you just can't throw money out there as a band-aid. You really got to get, get your boots on and get on the ground and work. And that's one thing this man has really, really done. And because he does that, uh, I see his friends, you know what I'm saying, Red Man and everybody else, who is truly, truly involved in the development of young people in the city of Newark and the greater Exus County. So with that being said, dude, come on up here, man. We appreciate you, brother. <laughs> How you guys doing this day? I just want to thank, um, thank you guys, man. Iota, Phi Theta. I never thought I would get a, an award from another fraternity. Here, right? That's 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 because you know it's love, man. And Ray and Leroy, man, you guys, you guys are special to me, man, because you you were part of my my teenage and, and young adult love years, you know. And, and becoming a man around you guys. You know, they say the people that you have around you, you kind of tell, you know, your character. And these are some good dudes, man. So I just want to say thank you to you guys. And I want to also say happy Father's Day to you guys out there. All of the fathers out there. And the moms for sticking by those fathers. You know, Father's Day. Yeah, you got to have a Father's Day. 
Father's Day, I, I think we get the, uh, the lesser of the day when it comes to the Father's Day and Mother's Day. But more importantly, to all of the fathers out there, man, there are a lot of young people out there that, that need us, that need male figures, that need to see us doing good, you know, to see us looking good. You know, they say when you look good, you feel good, and you do good. Um, coming from Newark, New Jersey, there are not a lot of, of male presence like it should be. I teach an after school program, and, and I can kind of tell what the future of that city looks like just from watching our youth. They're the future of the city, and I'm telling you that they need us, gentlemen. Not just your daughters, not just your sons, but our youth in our city. If we truly care about our cities and our surrounding cities, then we need to build our youth up and be there for them. You know, if they can see it, they can be it. So they need to start seeing us standing with our backs straight up and our shoulders back and our feet planted on the ground and mentally doing what we have to do in our city to make it better. If we truly want what we want to be good in our city, let's stop complaining. Let's stop hating on the people who are doing the good. If we, if we are truly going the same direction, then let's team up. Just because you don't agree with somebody's politics, just because you don't agree with somebody in power, if you agree that our city and our youth and our people need and want better, then let's put all of that aside and let's team up to make that happen. I thank you guys. Appreciate it. Introduction to the next gentleman we're going to hunt. Uh, he's part of the family, literally. Um, uh, sometimes you meet people, and you you know, especially when they're they're soft spoken, and you really don't you know. It takes time to kind of get to know them, and I appreciate that because once you get to know them, you kind of know whether your position on their attitude and behavior and perspective is solid or not because it took time to kind of develop those perspectives. And the next gentleman that I'm going to bring up. I'm going to read his bio, but, and he, he needs no, no, no introduction. I mean, I have to do it, but uh, if you know anything about plays and the entertainment world in terms of uh, Broadway and all that good stuff, you come across uh, his work. What I like about David is that uh, he's, a, he's a person that truly is a family man. Um, sometimes we do things and we don't understand the impact. We don't know what, uh, how it affects other people. So imagine somebody living in your brain, right? They, but they get to kind of see what you're thinking, and they, they're able to kind of draw from that perspective and see if it effectively deals with them. A lot of the things that do, and we do it all, and Mr. Mumford and other people do, affects a lot of people. So what easier way to affect a lot of people than to write a play, <laughs> right? To be an author, and to kind of put some things out there that really, 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 really touch the nerve of certain issues that we need to, and I think we need more of that. I think we need to be a little bit more transparent and honest about our relationships with each other and our relationships with other people in general. So, um, you ready to move? Yeah. Let's right. Just look at the screen for a minute, please.
So I remember years ago when uh, my wife told me that her cousin was uh, moving to the town we live in. And uh, I was like, okay, that's cool. You know, I was like, nah, she's like, we gotta go over there and see him and kind of do it the right way and uh, be a part of the welcoming committee. Because uh, David Rolls was a big group anyway, so he didn't need anybody else over there. But being that he was uh, part of the greater family, we found that uh, our obligation to kind of uh, go and welcome him. And before we can welcome him to Montclair, he welcomed us to his house. And uh, I, I thought that was big because a person who kind of does things uh, in a big way, but is still grounded, says a lot about their character. And I can say that about Duke, I can say that about Mr. Mumford, I can say that about John, and I can definitely say this about David Lamb. David Lamb is a playwright and a producer. He was born in Queens, New York, and raised in public housing in Astoria, Queens. David attended Hunter College, the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and Informational Affairs at Princeton University, and the New York University School of Law. While working in the world of Wall Street, his passion, uh, the struggles, and the stories of his Queens neighborhood continue to speak to him. And he wanted to tell stories that captured the social and political issues facing blacks and Latinos in New York. So David, being an entrepreneur, founded a publishing company, and in 1995 released the novel, Do Plantos Go Wit, W-I-T, Wit, Collard Greens. David toured college, uh, uh, colleges and speaking uh, about the book and in response to, uh, to that audience. In 2003, David wrote the stage play Plantinos and Collard Greens. I want children to uh, see the play performed in high schools and even uh, younger than that. We have to reach our children earlier and, and, we, have to, and need, we need to have this conversation sooner. It's important. Now, if you think about a person who is really educated, really bright, um, trying to find ways to make himself happy, but at the same time serve a purpose. That's hard to do. It's hard to kind of swing that paradigm between what you want and what everybody else needs. If you look at what's going on today, most people just deal with what they want. Forget what everybody needs, and that's not what we got. What we got up there was a presentation of what issues lie before us and has been here way back. Think about it. Remember that song, Maria? Remember that? Huh? Right? Remember those movies? You know, those, those types of conversations and things have gone on since I've been around. But it really hasn't really been addressed. And I think that what we saw was a conversation starter. What we saw was things that went before us to really start thinking about what we need to do to collectively get ourselves together. So uh, when I thought about that, and I thought about the impact of a play and the things he's written since then, which we're going to talk about shortly. Uh, it's really a microcosm of what we all need to do. We all need to take our self-inventory. We need to check ourselves. We need to get off of what we think is popular. We need to get more on what's most effective for everybody in our community. Because as you can see, when, mo when some of us eat, it's okay. But when all of us eat, we're good. Most people will not survive if it's all about themselves. But when we start talking about things that matter, when we start looking at ourselves in, in the way that we're supposed to, and then honoring those who had the heart to bring it up and put it before you, now we're making steps in the right direction. So David, that's why. Because you asked me, why me? Right? You deserve an honor, man. And I don't know what you've had for this, but I'm here to tell you today that we collectively appreciate the conversation that you started, the dialogue that we've had since then, and what we look forward to in the future, because you just started. The problem is once you start a spark, baby, you can't put it out. So I hope your writing pen is thick. I hope you have a poison pen. All right? Anyway, please uh, help me uh, honor Mr. David Lamb. This award goes to my wife. Uh, I'll, you know, and I, I'll tell you why, because um, I'm not sane. <laughs> I, I only appear to be. 
You said. Um, I just want to read this. This is Oscar Hammerstein. He's a famous uh, Broadway producer, and this is what he wrote being a producer means. And this is why you'll see I'm not sane. Um, I think only people in the theater know what a producer is. The public does not know. It knows what a writer writes, an actor acts, but it doesn't know what a producer does. But the workers in theater know. A producer is a rare, paradoxical genius. Hard-headed, soft-hearted, cautious, reckless, a hopeless innocent, a stern pilot, a mathematician who prefers to ignore the laws of math and trust intuition, an idealist, a realist, a practical dreamer, a sophisticated gambler, a stage-struck child. That's a producer. So a woman who would be with a maniac like that, I have to give her all the credit. Um, when I wrote Plotinos and Collard Greens, um, we thought we were just going to do it for one weekend, um, June 27, 2003, that was our plan. And then um, people came and saw it and they loved it. And um, it, it took off. Um, Ray said, I asked him, well, why, why me? You know, why me? Um, because, um, you know, being a, a writer is, you're all by yourself. It's, it's a lonely process that you don't really know the effect you're having on people. Um, but all around the country now, there's all of these, on college campuses, all of these uh, conferences entitled Platinos and College Reads, and you look at um, black student organizations around the country, and you look at the president, and it's like um, Devin Rodriguez, you know, <laughs> Anna Robles, you know, and it's like, that didn't exist 20 years ago. Right? Um, and when I wrote the play, it was my fantasy that um, it could somehow impact people's thinking and um, in a fantasy world, produce better relations between the nation of the Dominican Republic and Haiti. And if you think about it, it's an island with 20 million descendants of Africans. What if it was wealthy and we could do business with them? You know, and it starts with a change of, of mind. You know? So I was thinking about that and thinking about Father's Day. When I got into producing, um, I didn't realize that the actors weren't going to become like my children. <laughs> Probably wouldn't have done it. Um, but that's what happened. They become like the children. And just this week, um, I went to one of the actors' house. I'm working on a new play called um, The Best Things in Life. And it's about um, hip-hop's biggest star who decides to sell out. Uh, which, if you're in hip-hop, you know it's real. Um, and his hit song is, It's Good to Be Greedy. Right? And uh, the ancestors don't like what he's doing and they come to pay him a visit. Uh, and that's what the play's about. And, uh, but the, I, I, I got this young brother who's working on it, and um, he's really good. But like a lot of us, a lot of people in society, and black males in particular, he's got a voice in his head telling him he's not good, no matter how good he is. And so I said, we were supposed to be for rehearsal, and I said, well, no, let's not rehearse. I'm going to come over to your house. And I went to his house. He lives in a Frederick Douglass project on 104th Street in Manhattan. And he's a single father. And I was talking to him about how you gotta, you got to quiet that voice in your head. I mean, you have, you have a son now. You can't, you can't let those negative voices take over your life. And he had a, a, a poster on the wall of Jamaican sayings, different Jamaican slang, you know, what's going on, et cetera. And one of the sayings was um, Jinal. Not sure I'm saying it right, but Jinal, G-I-N-N-A-L. And it, it means a con man. And I said to him, it's funny because I was just having a talk with a friend of mine who's Jamaican, and we were talking about how that is actually comes from the Quran. Um, the last chapter of the Quran says, uh, protect me from the whisperings of the slinking devil, you know, who whispers into the hearts of men in jinn. That's where the word jinn out comes from. As Jamaican says, it's a con man. And we all got this con man whispering in our head telling us we're not good enough. You know, you're not worthy. And that, that's why I love theater. Because theater for me is a way to reverse that. 
You know, when you go to the movies and something spectacular happens, you, you lean back to look at the screen. But when you go to a theater and something captures your attention, you lean in. You don't lean back, you lean in. Because it reaches into your heart, it reaches into your soul and touches you. And it's different every night. And so for me, you know, it's a sacred space. I, I think it's a way where we can reach people, reach our youth, and get them to believe in their own greatness. We can reach adults and get them to believe in love again. Um, and so that's what I try to do. I try to write stories that make you laugh, make you think, and make you stand up and feel proud. Um, I'd like to say to the IOTAs, um, the first protest that IOTAs led was about theater right. in, in Baltimore. Right? And um, if we live in a world where somebody can be elected to the highest office in the land without one iota of ability, <laughs> Imagine what we could do if we had not one, but thousands of iotas. Thank you. So, as you can see, uh, I don't do Mr. Lamb any justice because he is a deep thinker, and more importantly, he's effective at getting you to understand his perspective. And then whether you're an MC, whether you're a playwright, whether you're a mentor, whether you're a principal, the whole point is to be bilingual meaning getting your point across to other people. Being a teacher and an educator, we learned early on not to force feed your way of teaching, but to teach them the way they learn. So these people I have before you today have mastered that ability to share their perspective and get it in like you would lotion. It may, you may be a little ashy after a while, but you keep rubbing it in, it's gonna get in there. And I, I am very <laughs> thankful to be a part of an organization that allows me to honor such great people. And uh, so, good job, David. All right, um, we do have a small thing we want to show you about our keynote speaker. Um, there were tons of other uh, We were trying to find some, some really deep things about Akbar. You know, everybody wants to get deep to talk about the brother. And, uh, we found a number of things to kind of talk about his accolades and the things he's done. The number one thing I did that I found out was call his school and talk to the people that work there. All that other stuff is cool. I mean, trust me, I, I would love to have Oprah come down and give me $500,000, right? And be on the Ellen Show two or three times where you can kind of hit her up and be, yeah, what up? You know what I mean? But what's more effective is that when I, I just coached a uh, All-Star game, last week, and we had uh, one of his players on my team. And having a conversation with that young man led me to believe more about what I heard about Akbar than anything else, because that's what mattered. The information that guy took from his school is gonna resonate in his life for years. Long after those clips go away, long after there's a new Akbar, long after there's somebody else coming up, that young man is going to remember what his experience was like in the West Side of High School. Knowing what it was like to be hungry and then be fed on Fridays. Knowing that they have a summer program that's going to be three days a week and getting it in. All right? Knowing that you don't have to be bashful or shy about not having clean clothes to wear. Why? Because you can go to school and get it done now. Have a bar. Right? So, the conversation I had with that kid had nothing to do with football. I had him for about a week and a half, and I knew I couldn't really get a, a good gauge of uh, Mr. Cook, but I was able to get enough that I realized that he's impactful. All right, being, uh, I met my wife at a social service agency when we were uh, still in college. Um, my man, Willie Miller's here. He 
he kind of worked in those types of agencies and uh, being an educator, you know the difficult days that lie before all of us, but particularly not for us, but for the kids. It's tough, man, it's tough. And, and it's funny because they, these kids become so desensitized to so many negative things that you don't even realize they suffer. They walk past you and give you a good morning and give you a what's up and don't even realize that boy didn't even eat last night, all right? He slept on something that was harder than a floor. You know what I'm saying? And still, I, I demand for him to be in my class on time and have a pencil or a pen and stay awake, right? So sometimes the things we expect of these young people are really aren't fair, and I don't think we understand it. But people like Mr. Cook uh, allow us, they kind of give us the porthole to look into what's going on in our society, right? We got two dynamic situations going on in this room. We got a principal who has worked his butt off to kind of save and share information with kids and families. And then we had the highest prosecutor in this room, in this county. You see what I'm saying? You see how the, the pendulum could swing either way? And it's funny because there's more commonality in their, in their jobs than you think. Because I know Mr. Stevens is an educator. And I know Mr. Akbar could be a disciplinarian too. So sometimes we wear many hats. We just gotta find the right hat to put on at the right time. And that's what I was talking about being by land. Yeah, move. So y'all want me to relive? <laughs> All right, so this is what we'll do. Um, what I want to do, if possible, uh, I want to bring Mr. Cook up and kind of, because uh, some of the people in this room are aware of his accolades and the things he's done, but some aren't. And what I do know is that uh, being uh, a product of North, the West Side. And being an educator, because I remember watching something, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you were saying how when you walked in a room, uh, they they think they was your skirt, they, you were security or something like that? Something crazy where you were on a, a, a you were being interviewed, and you, they didn't believe that you were, uh, I think when you first got hired as a teacher or something like that. And, you know, perceptions are always grounded in what you see, but really laid with what you know. And Mr. Cook quickly became a gentleman that I think the people in North realized that his uh, days of uh, teaching were gonna be uh, shorter than his days of administrating. So, are we good more now? Yeah, it's good now. All right, let's make, let's make it bigger. Let's try to get to it. Is you ready? Yeah, you oh, look at my son up here. <laughs> They call him the great debater because he's like he's into the uh, UN debate team and all that. Oh, that's not hard for Okay. Well, I guess not. All right, so look, let's do it like this. I'm going to read what I have here from Mr. Uh, Mr. Cook, and then uh, I'll let the brother come up and introduce himself and kind of share with you. But thank you for coming, my brother, and your family. Thank you for allowing us to uh, break bread with you and honor you today. Uh, Mr. Akbar Cook Sr. was born and raised in North's West Side. He attended Exodus Catholic High School, which is located in Torrance, now closed, uh, where he excelled as a student and basketball player. Mr. Cook attended college uh, on two basketball scholarships, attending St. Catherine's College in Kentucky before graduating with a Bachelor of Arts degree in education from, from Florida Atlantic, FAU. A, and received a uh, master's degree in administration. I'm sorry, FAU was located in Baton Rouge. I'm back, I'm not, Boca Raton, Florida, sorry. He went on to receive a master's degree in administration from St. Peter's University in Jersey City in 2006. Mr. Cook, uh, Mr. Cook's love for children. And let me know if you got it, man. You good? All right, let's start. Take three. See that, David? Administrators cannot change student lives. This next story is must see the TV. A high school principal in Newark doing something amazing to make sure kids do not skip school. He's putting washing machines and dryers on campus. So how will that help attendance, you might ask? Well, he says it will. Here's New Jersey reporter Tony Gates. 
when talk about that proverbial village actually takes form, it becomes places like this. This one is inside Westside High School. I kicked the football team out, yes. The team's old digs have become a laundry room for good reason. We found out the kids was being bullied and was being, being bullied because of their cleanliness. As a result, there was chronic absenteeism, kids missing three to five days a month. One time a student didn't want her bags checked to enter the school. We had to like almost detain her and we come to find out she was just carrying dirty clothes that she was like homeless for the weekend. Social media has made shaming a 24 hour nightmare for anyone targeted. These student athletes have seen the stinging effect on classmates. Especially when people see your ear talking about you and you can hear it but you don't want to say nothing. Every school year is this kid getting bullied all the time, coming to school a little Principal Cook has had his job for just two weeks. He's building a better village. PSENG gave the school money to create the laundry room for the students he vows to always fight for. Because the kids feel that, and they'll fight on that SAT, they'll fight on that test for you the same way you're fighting for them and other stuff that they can't control. So that's just who I am. Somebody posted the information about this laundromat here at Westside High, and boom, it caught fire. Take a look at this. Laundry detergent, dryer sheets, everything these students will need to wash their clothes for free. The laundry room at Westside High School will be open for students Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, beginning August 27th. But when school starts on September the 4th, my kids will be able to use it daily after school. In Newark, Tony Yates, Channel 7, Eyewitness News. So I want to just finish this quick bio. Mr. Quick, uh, Mr. Cook is well known for having a stern yet caring presence in the lives of many Newark's youth. His desire to uplift and educate children is always at the forefront of his work in North Public Schools. Mr. Cook volunteers in food kitchens and participates in Christmas tree and toy drives. He also organizes recreational activities for North Public School students and works closely with the North Police Department to ensure safe transportation for all students after school functions. In addition to serving as the Vice Principal of North Westside and Head Basketball Coach, Mr. Cook also serves as while well, he served as co-director of the Great North Life Camp, uh, a summer camp of any city youth. Mr. Cook and his wife, Sheridan, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, yeah. are the proud parents of Yassin Akbar Jr. and Ahmad. Now, obviously, this was written long before uh, Mr. Cook has become principal, uh, but it doesn't take away from the work he's done. And it looks like you've been doing it long before you became principal. So if anything else we can take from this uh, experience with you, is that we all can play a part in changing our communities. Um, we don't have to be principals, though. We just need to take, uh, we have a mentoring program in East Orange called Each One Reach One, uh, directed by Mr. Mr. Miller. And those, those ideas of everybody pitching in on their own and trying to do one thing, as the word IOTA means, instead of trying to do everything in a poor way. With that being said, Mr. Cook, congratulations. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I got that principal voice, so I got to bear with me. I want to thank the IOTA Phi Theta Fraternity Incorporated, Phi Meg Alumni Chapter in Northern New Jersey. I want to thank my family. I got some folks up here from Florida Absolutely. and from New Jersey. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a pleasure sitting at the table with Do. Do I grew up watching Do, and then uh, you know, at the last couple of years, Do has always supported me. So it's just crazy that like, we have the table together now. So that's just it's a pleasure, man. So thank you, Do, for everything. Um, just just want to tell you like my story. So single single parent home. Uh, my grandma was very big. Grandma's still alive. Grandma's 90 years old, still lives in Newark. And uh, grandma always was a caregiver. Grandma was the foster parent to this disadvantaged youth. And uh, she took them in and adopted them. And those, those same kids are still my cousins. They're with us now. And I think at that very young age, uh, that's how it got ingrained in my DNA. That I had uh, my aunts were uh, in the education business. So I remember growing up playing basketball and my auntie, which is Carolyn Cook, who taught at 13th Ave with Duwin for 30 years. My auntie, um, she always exposed us, whether it was to the Boys and Girls Club. She, um, 
I was like the last person to get a Speedy job that worked at Life Camp. Everybody remember Speedy. And uh, during those times, that's when I started to realize as a camp counselor that I could uh, move children. I knew I had this uh, this thing that was ingrained in me that they, that they they understood my plight and I understood them. And uh, I remember when it was time for me to go to school, you know, everybody say, well, you know, what's your uh, major going to be? And I said, business administration. So thinking that, you know, that would be a good something to choose. And I got there and had a 1.8 that first semester. Because <laughs> I don't like math. So business was definitely wasn't the, uh, the right choice for me. So I remember calling IT. I said, IT, I don't know what I'm doing. What, what should I do? She said, ah, you know, uh, you love the kids. Once you go into education, I promise you I will stick around until you, you know, graduate. And I will walk you through the doors and pass the torch to you. So I changed my major to education and I started doing well. And as uh, they said earlier, um, I left, I got my associate degree from uh, St. Catherine and I went down to Florida Atlantic. And I went down to Florida Atlantic and it was, it was Florida, it was South Florida, it was beautiful weather, it was women everywhere, it was like so. I got, I got another 1.8. <laughs> so, so uh, now I had, I had like one foot in and one foot out and I just kept remembering you know, the teachings of my aunts and my grandmother and everybody. And I'm like, man, I can't go home and be that guy in the house. I just cannot. So I remember I would call, like, now you need money and stuff. And I remember I called Auntie and she said, first of all, don't you ever call me and ask me for something. You pulled a call and asked him, I'm okay. All right. So I said, okay. So every time I needed something from Auntie, I would call her maybe a week ahead before I actually needed the money. <laughs> so, um, I remember telling my teeth that I wasn't doing so well. She said, just bog down again. I got you when you come out. Uh, it was an alternate route program. So alternate route, if you don't know, is a way if you don't have an education degree, you can still teach. So I remember saying, like, I wasn't doing so well in, the, in the education. And she was like, just, just finish up. I got you. And when you come home, I got you. So I just kept procrastinating and kept procrastinating. I ended up having to go to summer school one of those years, and then I... Uh, I, uh, it took me longer, it took another year, fifth year to graduate, even though that's more of an average now, but it took me the fifth year. And what had happened, and my auntie got sick, and my auntie passed away. And it was while I was in summer school, and I remember it was, uh, I had like all these papers due, and it was a bad time, I lost my aunt and my uncle at the same time. And uh, it seemed like these bees just started dropping from heaven, so I just started getting all these bees on my tests and everything. And I ended up uh, graduating, and I knew that was auntie looking down on me, but I ended up graduating, then I came home, and I, uh, that's when Umi, uh, my cousin Nikki, her mother, Umi, she was still working at the board, but Umi was, did everything. Umi was in payroll, Umi was in uh, facilities. She did whatever downtown know she can get, she was down there. So Umi took me in, you know, to pick up the slack that Auntie had, even though she passed, and Umi brought me through the doors, and, and as uh, you were saying, that when I first got hired, they hired me because I was a big black guy and they wanted me to be this drill sergeant to just yell at kids and just move them like that way. And it wasn't who I was. So I struggled my first couple years trying to find myself because I, I wasn't who they wanted me to be. They ended up uh, sending me to another school, which was a blessing in disguise. And um, I started to uh, figure out like what really my pathway was. And I started, you know, moving the kids and now I started being this excellent teacher and started getting some uh, awards and stuff. And I remember Umi was like, okay, I, you got your master's. Because I went back, That was I skipped over that, but I went back while I was at that first school. I wanted to prove to IT that I could do it. So I graduated from St. Peter's, summa cum laude, all A's this time. Yes, to let us know that. Yes, so when I got to the new school, I, um, I started doing well, and then Umi started sending me, I said, okay, I, all right, you're a good teacher now. You need to, you need to, uh, you know, take your, take your show on the road, like become an administrator and do more for the kids. And I was like, nah, Umi, I'm good. I, I, I'm, I'm all right. I just want to stay in the classroom. And she said, ah, I, I know you, I'm telling you, you could be a great administrator if you just, you know, you just, you know, put your mind to it. And I was like, nah, Umi, I'm good. So after a while, Umi wouldn't even be saying hello to me. Umi would just send emails that was job postings. It would just be like vice principal here. <laughs> Vice principal there. <laughs> so um, uh, I want to say around Umi, Umi was going to retire when we had a retirement party at a big ocean dig. And uh, I want to say about a month after Umi uh, had her retirement party, she was diagnosed with uh, stage four lung cancer. And uh, I ended up losing Umi. And it was like I had these two women that wanted the most for me. 
and saw the potential and I didn't seize the opportunity. So a lot of the things that you guys were seeing now is like me, like carpet diem, me seizing the day. My aunts wasn't able to smell those roses. So now I go so hard because I want them to be proud of me and I want them to know that everything they ingrained in me is still here and I'm, and I'm taking it on and giving it to these babies. So that's a lot of the stuff that you see just where, you know, just coming out of the West Side of just love and that's been the, the backbone. So I want to say about a month after Umi passed away, it's like Auntie was dropping bees. Umi must have dropped the uh, vice principal job because I got a vice principal job at North Vocational like right after. And um, when I first got to North Vocational, it was new. I needed. I was a basketball coach, but the kids didn't know me. So it was like it's, it's funny how the love of sports and how the kids gravitate to the athletes. They allowed me to be me in the school, and we started to write the ship, and we started doing some amazing things at North Vocational. And then we got the word that they wanted us to move to West Side. West Side was the Bermuda Triangle of schools, if you don't know, ladies and gentlemen. Everything that went in West Side, nothing came out. So, so I was scared, right? So, and I'm a West Ward kid. So, I want to say about a, uh, like right before uh, we was going over to West Side, I went there just to go get a lay of the land. This young lady just was running the halls, cursing up the storm. And I'm looking at the principals that was there, like, I just let that happen. And it just it just was the norm at West Side, right? Everybody was walking the halls like it was at Jersey Gardens Mall. It was like, <laughs> window. I'm like, so I knew what I was getting into. So I want to say about a week before uh, we got into West Side, um, that same young lady that I referenced, they found her a body in an abandoned building. She was um, killed because she was pregnant and didn't want the baby. So that was my first bout of death. And uh, I want to say those first days at West Side was, it was scary. It was like the scenes out of training day. So many kids just throwing these gang signs and all this old stuff. And I was like, what did I get myself into? And I just remember the teachings of just my family. It's like, the gangsters don't come to school. The gangsters stay home. The, the, the kids that's there, they're either scared of somebody that's going to get them at home or you know, someone loved them enough to send them to school. So I started looking at it a different way. So I said, you know what, I'm just gonna be consistent. I'm gonna do it with love. And we just gonna just keep doing what we have to do. So after I kicked out the gangsters, right? I had to kick them out because some of them just didn't want to do it. Then we started getting down to the, to, to the nitty gritties of why we did the education part and being consistent. And I want to say everything was, it was, it was, it was flowing. And about midway through that school year, uh, they kidnapped one of my boys. And it was like the scene out of Peyton Ford, kidnapped him because allegedly he was the, uh, he knew all of the good drugs were. And when he didn't um, give it to him, they dumped his body in Georgia King Village. So that was two kids that I lost. And I remember going into the summer just feeling so helpless. So I was watching RLS media and it seemed like everything that happened in the last morning that my kids were doing it or was happening to my kids. So I, I saw just this helpless feeling. And that, that summer was terrible. And I remember we started school back up and we started doing better. Now the kids were in class, we had teachers teaching and it was moving, we were sending kids to school. And I had this one kid who was just still straddling the fence of being in the streets and being, you know, in school. And uh, he said, Cook, man, I want my mother to see me go across that stage. And I remember he just kept saying that he was doing his thing. And about two weeks before graduation, they killed him in a drive by shooting. That was three kids that I had passed away. So summer was rapidly approaching and I knew I had to do something. I didn't want to do I, went, I didn't want another helpless summer. So I went to my alumni association, I went to MCJ Amelia Foundation and I said, uh, can we please open up uh, my school? We just want to call it lights on because lights stay on in schools. I don't know why, I don't know who's paying a bill. I guess I'm paying a bill, but, but the lights stay on. So I was like, we're gonna call it lights on. Let's, let's create a boys and girls club type atmosphere where the kids can have recreation, we can feed them, we can do all of this stuff. And it'd be a way for us to help them during those peak hours where crime is prevalent. So you think, think about 6 to 11 p.m. Pretty much no cop is gonna say anything to any kids that's in the streets or doing their other stuff because it's, it's normal. Cops will probably start saying something around 11. Like, okay, you are your curfew, where are you supposed to be at? So that time, that's when the kids were getting into trouble. So we opened up, I wanna say, it's about 30 people. It was a weird demographic because I had 40 year old parents, I had 25 year old gangbangers, and then eight year olds. So it was just a weird mixture, but they needed us nonetheless. So we just was doing whatever we had to. And when we first started off, it probably was like basketballs and jump ropes. And, and, but, but it was working and then we was feeding them. And I want to say the, uh, that went on for about a couple of weeks. And then uh, Barry Carter, who writes for the Star Ledger, 
I recorded the article, when the article got out, and everyone started to see uh, that we was there, and I started asking about 160 kids were coming every, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And we had this amazing turnout this whole summer, and I wanted to do a celebration just to, you know, just to celebrate what we did in the, in the West Ward. And we had uh, this big celebration. We had ice cream trucks come out. I had, we was giving out vacuum cleaners, Keurig machines. It was huge. I had 278 people come out to that event. And I remember one of my girls, 15-year-old girl, came up, gave me a high five, got some ice cream, and she left. And then later on, she was killed that night by a straight bullet. That was four kids that I lost. So I went back to my alumni associations and I said, we need to do something during the school year. We can't wait till the summer to save these babies. Let's do something during the school year. So I changed my athletic schedule around and we started doing lights on uh, every Friday during the school year. And with the emphasis being more on the ladies, and now we have the henna, we have the makeup, we have the fashion and design, I got the recording studio. And then since then, this was almost three summers ago, we've been averaging about 350 uh, students and we haven't lost any more kids gun violence. And that's just with a lot of help from the community. I mean, the New Jersey Community Food Bank, they give me the food. I mean, it's just so much stuff that you guys, when you think about uh, what these children need, it's, it's, it's everything. It's some, some parents are working hard. Some parents are working two and three, four jobs, and there's some parents that I did. You got great grandmothers raising kids, and, and it's just hard for a great grand to raise a 15-year-old, 16-year-old girl or boy. It's very hard. So some of the new barriers that they were facing was eating. And I didn't know that, so I'm, so I said, okay, I know what I can do. I can you know, speak to the community food bank, and I'm gonna get all of this food to help out the kids that need it. Parents signed up and everything, so we started doing uh, our family packs. The family pack is enough food for a family of four uh, to take home on the weekend, so they can eat. If they had eight, we'll give them two packs. So started doing that, but then it was, how do you call these kids down without embarrassing them? Back? So. Pride is a sin, and it was and it, the pride was getting in the way. Because some of the kids would come down, they would they would take one thing out, leave the family pack, or be scared to take it out. So I'm like, how can I do it? So I started going to the mall, getting our apostle bags and gap bags, and just trying to hide it in there. But again, that still was just a band aid. And again, the kids still were going without because they'd rather go home with nothing to eat than someone see them going home. It's just the weirdest thing ever. And uh, so I watched Chopped on the Food Network. So if you, you know the premise of Chopped, Chopped takes these mystery ingredients and you have to make a meal out of it. So I said, you know what? I'm going to do West Side Chopped. I'm going to show these kids what they can do with these uh, mystery ingredients. Because in the, in, in the bag, it'll be Cheerios, tuna fish, noodles, and ragu. It's like, what do you do with this? So, so that's why I did Chopped. And we did it for about two episodes before I, I canceled my show. But it worked. Now the kids are taking the food home. And now we're doing, uh, we, took, we added fresh produce from house. So every day, uh, every Friday from 3 to 6 p.m., we give out fresh produce. Plus, we still give out the family packs. So now they got more of a, 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 a full meal. So now I'm thinking we good. I said, OK, we took care of that. And then I started getting all these reports about my attendance. They said 85% uh, of your kids are severely chronically absent. Severely chronically absent means they're staying home three to five days a month. We're like, wow. So when you start doing the unpacking, sending folks to the door and asking parents, they said, we don't have clean clothes. We don't, we don't have this, that, and the third. So I'm like, wow. Um, okay. So I went to uh, the alumni, and at the table, when I uh, was speaking to the alumni, PSNG was there. And PSNG was like, you work, you need that? Okay, here. They say, write a grant and we'll give you some money. I wrote the worst grant in history. <laughs> we need washes and dryers. <laughs> well, PSDNG gave me $20,000 right then and there. And, uh, so then I know I got Tracy in from all the public schools. But then I went to North Public School thinking I had, so I said, yes, baby, I got $20,000, let's do this. So North Public School was like, okay, you know, we got to send the architect in there and all that stuff. By the time they were done, they said, my room was going to cost $300,000. Wow. I said, I wanted a laundry mat, not a laundry house. <laughs> so it stalled. But while it was stalling, I had a school store. And at the time, I was giving a power. How dare I sit on a power that said West Side Cross when I had a baby that was going without. So I was giving, this is bad business. That's why I told you I had a 1.8 in business school. I was giving out all of the apparel 
And then again, it was just a band-aid. And then uh, the matter started getting worse. I, the, the story that you hear about the young lady, she came in. And I was just like everyone else. I would just look at the, the, the cover because she was made up, her eyebrows, slave makeup. It was, she was beautiful. But she was have she had a bag of dirty clothes in her bag, and she was homeless for weeks. So I was just caught up like everyone else. So how dare I again? It's for, I'm supposed to be her protector, and I didn't know. So when she fought like that, and we found out, I said I couldn't wait no longer. We went back, and by now, uh, my new superintendent, Ross Leon, was there, and he pretty much made the uh, the, the laundry mat come to fruition. So we, we we put it in, and we've been rocking and rolling. And then you guys saw that it uh. It uh, started getting national attention. That same one with Tony um, aired, and I, I was so happy to see myself on TV. I, I had tape, and I'm on there, like I'm on there, <laughs> tape myself on there, and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna post this to Facebook. And if you guys know anything about Facebook and uh, Instagram, Instagram only lets you get 59 seconds. So I thought, like, why would I put 59 seconds up there? No one's going to really know. I said, you know what? Let me just do it. And luckily, I did it because. That made its way all the way to Burbank, California, because that's what Ellen saw. She saw that 59 seconds. So when I got the call to go on Ellen, it was like surreal. I was, I'll be honest with you, you get a call from Ellen, it's crazy. <laughs> but um, took my whole family out there. And just backstage, I'm not going to the tangent, but I'm going to tell you about my Ellen trip, right? <laughs> so, so, so you have to, they have a producer, and you're in the back, and they're going over the questions they're going to ask, right? So they tell you, like, listen, don't talk about your kids dying. And my audience may not like it. Again, I'm with the producer. I'm like, okay, so I can't talk about that. And they were saying uh, something else. They was, I forgot what they said, but they was like, tell me what I can't do. And while I'm going over it backstage, I'm messing up. They're like, yo, you cannot mess up on TV. There's 50 million people. So now the pressure's mounting. I'm like, yo, this, I didn't know it was going to be this scary. Right? So, and mind you, Ellen, you don't even see Ellen until this time. So now I'm backstage. They walk you down. Now I'm backstage. Now you can hear Ellen out there. And uh, they're like, yo, these four seats, do you imagine who sat in these four seats? And in my heart beat, I don't care who sat in them seats, I'm about to pass out. <laughs> so, so now they play the little uh, the, 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 the trailer before I come out. And I never saw it before. And I see the kids, I'm like, oh, I'm oh. on. They're like getting teary eyed and stuff. And they're like, all right, Akbar Cook. And I just thought I had a smooth Billy Me walk when I came out. <laughs> but my legs are shaking so hard when I got out there. But, and guess what, I sit down, first question, Ellen asked me that I had nothing to do with anything, and if you watch it again, you'll see me like, okay, Ellen, and I'll answer it. And she said, yeah, but I heard you lost four kids. And I'm like, didn't you tell me that? <laughs> so, but just the, just the impact from just uh, the show, I have so much laundry detergent now, guys. I mean, it is, like that, when they showed that clip, it's nothing. I have classrooms full of laundry detergent. So. We started to uh, ask everyone that was sending stuff, can you please stop sending laundry detergent? My kids need toiletries, they need feminine products, they need uh, toothpaste, whatever you can think of that a kid that's on their own would have. And now we opened up a free school store with all of those supplies. If you ever come by, I'll show you, it's amazing. Um, But it's just been this it's just been this roller coaster. Like I, I, I was telling uh, the family, I said I've been like speaking like I want to say twice a month since September, and it's been amazing. So uh, I thank you guys. Truthfully, I mean anything you guys need. If, like I said, you need laundry detergent. I'm there. <laughs> um, but like Dude was saying, man, these kids need you more than ever. It's it's it's, it's almost horrific the things they're going through. Um, social media is the gift and the curse. You know, the bullying used to stop when you went home. Now it's 24-7, it's on there, and now the world can see it's, it's, it's bad. These kids have a lot to go through, and it's like, if you can just, just be a mentor. Like, we've been doing some stuff where mentors can be virtual. You can just be a mentor, go on our website, uh, friendsofwestside.org. You can become a mentor. Even if you're in another state, just check in on one of these babies, just make sure they're good. It's a text, it's anything that can help them out because where we had the village, it's not the village now, folks are scared to come out and we gotta start changing that narrative. But I um, just wanna leave you guys with a proverb that I usually leave with, it says a uh, candle doesn't lose its flame by lighting other candles. So please keep lighting other candles, thank you. Thank you. Just to kind of 
put a bow on this thing. There's a couple things I want to say. Uh, please feel free. First of all, let me uh, move. Let me get your attention real quick. We want to thank Mr. Mustafa Moon and Team One Media. Uh, if you don't know, um, Moon is the man. Of, uh, he's a jack of many trades, uh, but this is his passion. Uh, he's worked in the educational system with me. Um, he kind of takes care of all the recordings of all the football games in our area, outside of uh, you know being a past accountant and all the other stuff that he's done. But more importantly, when I needed somebody to come through, Mr. Mustafa Hooten did. And not only did he come through and, and hook us up with this whole thing, but he, uh, he streamed, this is streaming live. So while all the, all the people who are uh, part of his network were able to see Mr. Cook and everybody else speak today. So for that, we appreciate you, brother. I, do, I would like to, just before everybody leaves, um, particularly the honorees, let's have, um, we have one more part to do, but just, I know Duke has to go with a few people. I'm going to take a picture uh, with the honorees uh, on this side here. And then um, we, we're going to have Mr. Uh, Dennis Isaac come up and say a few words uh, about our, uh, the uh, scholarship part of what we're doing. Um, so we are giving scholarships to some deserving youth. Uh, some are here, some are not. Uh, but uh, for those who are here, we recognize you. Uh, this is the reason why we do it. Um, we do want to thank fathers, but at the same time, we want to thank our youth for participating and being an active part in the academic landscape of what we are truly trying to become, and this is better people. Um, that being said, I would just like to take this time for everyone on three. You're going you're to help me out here. I want you to think about one person in your life, male, whether it's a mentor, whether it's a father, uh, whether it's a principal, whether it's a coach. And I'm going to say one, two, three. And when I say three, I want you to say that person's name, whoever that is. Um, I am big on giving respect to our ancestors. Um, I grew up with my mom, who did a great, great, great job. Um, she reminds me, somebody was speaking earlier about uh, of you, uh, about your aunt, and how, uh, like my mother, when she worked at East Orange, was the head of payroll, and then she was the head of benefits. And then she was worked for the principal. So that kind of spoke to me. And uh, I know that I would not be the father I am without the people in my life. And part of those people are uh, not just men. But those being said, my grandfather was big in my life. And I'm, uh, so if you could think of one person who was male, uh, who was a mentor in your life, or played a big part and was a father, and the count of three, please say their name. One, two, three. Sorry. Oh. Oh. All right, thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right, um, if you gotta go to the bathroom, let's do that. Let's have a little water. Do I know you guys gotta go? So let's uh, let me have my honorees over here to take a quick picture. Then when we come back, we'll do the uh, recipients of the scholarship, and then I'll turn you guys loose. All right. Thank you. Yeah. into the front court to Khalil Whitney. Go into the basket and the jam! ...conversation with them because they are getting resources from the city. They are getting resources and they are arguing with us about the timeliness of those resources.
And he's up back on the center. Oh! Well, Ross just took him and defeated him. Exclusive. Exclusive. And he's up back on the center. Have you ever asked yourself, why can't I buy a car online? Well, now you can. At Salerno Dwayne Ford, we made buying a new Ford easier than ever. At SalernoDwayneFord.com, you pick the vehicle you want, the model, the color, and choose a payment. It's that easy. We'll even deliver your new car to your home. Now at Salerno Dwayne Ford, car buying is just a click away. Hi, I'm Mike Podell of Salerno Dwayne Auto Group in Seminole, New Jersey. Salerno Dwayne has always been committed to our local community. Whether it's local youth or high school sports, performing arts, the local police and fire departments, Salerno Dwayne believes in giving back, building stronger, healthier, and safer communities. At Salerno Duane, we're dedicated and proud to support our local community partners. Hey, so, on the scene. Dribbles into the front court to Khalil Whitney. Go into the basket and the jam.
conversation with them because they are getting resources from the city. They are getting resources, and they are arguing with us about the timeliness of those resources. making time for us and what we do. So we had to kind of negotiate and make sure that they can get here and be, leave at a certain time. All right, um, first person, young lady, Kyla. Kyla, you still here? Where you at, sis? Dennis? Yeah. Kyla? Caleb. Caleb, I'm sorry. You see it? Yeah, yeah. Come on, raise your hand, girl. There we go. Come on up here, Caleb. Come here, baby. All right, so Kayla Isaac uh, attended Westchester Area School uh, to grade seven. Then she was accepted to Quality Charter Middle School in the Bronx, New York. Kayla is a senior at uh, Equality Charter High School where she continues to excel as an honor student. Kayla is the secretary of her senior class and vice president of the student body. Kayla is very, very much involved with her community. Kayla serves as the president of the Harvesters for Change, which is a community outreach program in the Bronx, which provides peer-to-peer -peer counseling along with volunteer community projects. Kayla also serves as the secretary of her senior class. Kayla volunteered her time uh, to tutor and serves as a mentor in eighth graders and freshmen along with children uh, with autism and special needs, which is really what I and my wife, my wife particularly does. So, you know, you're kind of right, messing with our heart right there. Kayla also has a special gift in dealing with children. Kayla enjoyed volunteering with uh, Assisting Adventures, a church organization for children. The counselor for Rebound Help Center and Vacation, I'm sorry, Vocational Bible School with Sister Kimberly Hall Gordon. Uh, with that being said, Kayla, Kayla plans to become a, now you got a conscious word from her. You know what, you cut it off and it's not finished. All right, so Kayla's plans are to become an obstetrician, obstetrician gynecologist. Let's give it up for Ms. Kayla. All right. All right, yes, Next up, my man. Now, uh, is it Nassai? Nassai. Nassai. Not say. Say it again. Took the moon. Not say. Thank you. Um, I am horrible with names, but great with faces. And so, not say. Please don't take it uh, personally. Not say. Benjamin Moon is from Pleasant, Pleasant Valley High School. A graduate. Um, oh, okay. Here we go. Graduate cum laude. June seven, two thousand nineteen. He was able to maintain a high GPA and achieve high honors uh, in the classroom while uh, accelerating in sports. When it comes to sports achievements, Nasay holds the school record in the 100 meters, 100 meter dash, as well as uh, setting his school record in rushing yards in the single game. Uh, he is a Times News Area All-Star and Eastern Pennsylvania Conference North Second Team All-Star running back. This fall, Nasay will be entering Shippensburg University on a football scholarship, where he'll be majoring in mechanical engineering. Nasay, come on up here, brother. It seems that we do have a, 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 a God because we're, we're short on time, but the other recipients um, are not here today uh, due to other obligations. So we're going to give you two all the praise. And uh, let's say, look at me, man. We appreciate both of you, all of you actually, but you too because you're here particularly. Uh, we look forward to staying, we're going to stay in touch with you. We want to see the maturation process. And we want to know uh, all the ins and outs of your educational experience, but more importantly, uh, we know that the road is winding. So what you plan may change, just be fluid like water, 
and just don't get too stuck on what we're thinking about because you never know. But we praise you and we, we are happy that you're part of what we're doing today. So thank you. Let's give my hand on the floor. Okay. Yes, I'll help you. Come on, Selena. Look at baby. Look at my girl over there. Come on, Selena. Come on, Selena. Hey, hey, I need my arm. I need my body. Are you? Mm. Mm, that's right. Mm. 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 I can talk. This is my, my not only is my my sweetheart to the fraternity, but she's married to my frat brother, and uh, this is family. Come on, come on. Well, come on up here. Hello, everybody. I'm Sister's wife. Um, this is Selena. She is my goddaughter. Uh, she is from St. James Church. She is on on her way. She runs track, right? My track star. I've had her since she was little, little to where she is now. And <coughs> you are going to North Carolina AT and T. Right? Um, she doesn't have a bio, but she's a beautiful young lady. And I watched her grow up from a little one to a big one. And statistics. Statistics. Amen. <laughs> because I don't know anything about that. But she is a beautiful young lady, and she got great things, and I can't wait to see what God has in store for her. My son, Leon Ruff. All right, so uh, what we're going to do, uh, we have some uh, certificates of achievement for you. Uh, we're going to give it to you on your way out, and your stops will be deemed uh, August for you to go to school. Right. So congratulations again. All right. Yeah, let's go and take a uh, The parents let, let the uh, recipients take it first, and then uh, by themselves, and then if the parents can get involved in the group picture, and then each parent with each kid. That'll be uh, how we'll close it out. Um, if there's any questions uh, or comments, please see me uh, before we leave. If not, the brothers are here uh, to. Uh, Feel any questions you have. That being said, this closes out our. Dennis, this is the 24th episode? 20th? 12th. Uh, 12th. Uh, our 12th annual Father's Day Scholarship Brunch. Thank you for your participation and thank you for coming. Thank you. Hey, Will. And thank you to DJ Will on the wheels of steel. Tom, Will held it down for us. Thank you, brother. Will, is this yours? Okay. All right, Lee, you, know, you, you cannot take the mic home. I know you wanted to, but you said no. Give it back to Will, brother. Where's Dana? Dana, your husband's trying to take his wife take this home. I don't know what he's going to do with it. He's saying, babe.